Yeah? How about that? Do you feel like it? Yeah, then we all get warmer. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> Fun. Okay, I, I would say we get started. Um, we are... We are, we are getting towards the end. We still have a few to go, a uh, few s talks to go, and we have a, a keynote from a mysterious speaker. Beautiful. Um, we have sustainable open source from Floor, which is a community. Nope. No, it's not. It's not she's not. Well, she's not yes, a community. She's yep. not a community. I'm not going to tell you what she does. It's a super long title, and I fell asleep midway. So, uh, Floor, please join me. Give it up for her. Good luck. But I appreciate you for trying. Um, I yeah, you did try. Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, it's nice that you come sit a little bit closer, so I feel a little bit of your warmth because I've been freezing in this room. I don't know about you. Um, all right, so sustainable open source. In this modern world, we rely on a lot of components for all of our stuff to work and for it to continue to work. Um, and I know you know this to be true, but I still want to elaborate a little bit because I'm up here now and I'm giving a talk. So if that was the statement, that would have been a really, really short talk. Um, so there's been a um, 2022 uh, study uh, by OSRA uh, together with the Synopsis uh, group and it came back that 97% of uh, 2,400 plus uh, audited code bases contain open source software. Maybe you're not surprised. It is a large number, though. Um, and some of the some of the sort of like subgroups, sub industries that they were uh, investigating, even sometimes contained uh, up to 99% of uh, open source in their commercial code base. Um, so large enterprises and all kinds of companies uh, rely on libraries that are sometimes maintained only by a single individual in their free time. Uh, and that creates potentially some attack surface, right? Um, and sometimes organizations will restrict their, um, the, the way that you can use their software or end of life versions that are actually open source and that's all kinds of uh, uh, difficult to, to deal with. And so in the next 30-ish minutes, uh, I'll get cues whenever I run over time, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the viability and the sustainability of open source software uh, so that we can all continue to enjoy uh, the benefits that it brings. So who am I? Uh, my name is Floor. Uh, my full title is on there, so now you, <laughs> now you know. Um, I do enjoy my chickens a lot, so uh, hence this picture that was taken by this wonderful gentleman here in the front. So if you ever need a new profile picture, you know, now know how to go to, uh, who to go to. Uh, I'm a staff community program uh, manager at Ivan. I just switched jobs actually last week, so don't ask me what I do because I don't really know yet. Um, uh, I was at Ivan before, but uh, I just switched teams. Uh, Ivan is a database as a service company, so we have a couple of open source data tools that we manage and that we offer, and we also contribute to these upstream projects like Postgres and Kafka as well. Um, previously, I was at Microsoft and I was at Grafana Labs. Uh, I'm part of DevOps Days uh, core team. I organize DevOps Days or co organize DevOps Days uh, Amsterdam and DevOps Days Eindhoven. I'm Microsoft MVP. And I also uh, uh, organize a lot of meetups. Uh, contributing to today is one of them that sort of started around pandemic time and was basically just conversations with a lot of open source maintainers and uh, anyway, like people in the open source space learned a ton from those meetups too. Uh, and what I've learned from those meetups, I gave a talk at FOSDEM earlier this year, uh, so if you wanna check that out, uh, what you, how you can sort of spot healthy open source communities, then definitely go to the FOSDEM website. All right, what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, we're gonna talk about some issues that uh, are prevalent in open source these days, and one of those is uh, project relicensing uh, their, their um, 
software in order for, to avoid free riding uh, from, for instance, cloud providers, more on that later, or to avoid that bad people use people's software to do more bad, uh, or to alleviate some responsibility. Uh, also recently, relicensing because they couldn't secure funding and it was sort of like posed as a threat. If you don't give us funding, then we need to relicense in order to make money out of this uh, thing. Um, I hear a little bit of feedback here. Is that okay? Is that normal? I hope that nobody in the audience hears this. Um, and another problem is this, uh, this idea of the project that is maintained by a single uh, individual in Nebraska. I'm sure you've all seen this XKCD comic uh, uh, that is absolutely like <laughs> wonderful and you'll see it around a lot. Um, and um, it is more prevalent than you would think or that you would want it to be. So while curl is successfully maintained by Daniel Sandberg mostly in his lonesome, for every curl there is a log4j, right? Uh, that is actually, uh, yeah, <laughs> not great. Um, and with every NPM library you bring in, you bring in a whole host of NPM libraries uh, and all their transitive uh, licenses, uh, for instance, uh, that you need to keep track of because that's creating an attack service. Um, and there is a lack of resources that maintainers can tap into in order for them to really spend the time on their project that, uh, you know, like the uses by bigger companies or enterprises would really warrant them to spend on it. Um, and also maintainers can sometimes make very rash decisions. They're much like you and me in that way, right? Like sometimes they will want to protest something or they will want to have their opinions heard. Uh, and sometimes they will use their work in order for people to actually listen to that. Um, are these the only issues that are plaguing open source? Definitely not. But again, I only have 30 minutes uh, and I would love to talk to you about, you know, like diversity, equity and inclusion in open source or lack thereof. Um, but again, like let's, let's focus on these two, two topics and then maybe in the hallway or the barbecue we can talk about all the other things. Um, so in the recent years, we've seen an increase of kind of open source licenses. Um, and I wanna have a look at a couple of them. So for instance, the Commons Clause that uh, aims to restrict uh, commercial free riding uh, on open source uh, code, especially uh, cloud service providers who don't give back to open source projects. Um, and the Commons Clause actually conflicts with the FSD, the free software definition, uh, which, is, which claims the right to uh, use software for any purpose, and the open source definition, the OSD, in that the license shall not uh, restrict any party from selling or giving away the software. And there is a bunch of sort of ambiguous wording in that license, uh, and I don't wanna give you a license lecture because that's not great. Um, but for instance, it says that their value it derived entirely or substantially, but it doesn't really explain what substantially even means. So like beyond what uh, would, would that actually uh, come into play. And MongoDB used that uh, license for a while as that did Redis Labs. Uh, Redis Labs actually combined it with Apache, which is a dual license and that brings in a whole host of other problems, by the way, because when, when does what work? Um, and Mongo then uh, uh, switched to the SSPL, uh, which is uh, kind of like the GPL license, but with more restrictions, and it's not approved by the open source uh, initiative. If you're not aware, open source initiatives are the, uh, initiative is the stewards of the open source definition, so the OSD. Um, so there is a couple of licenses that, you know, become prevalent sort of the last uh, recent years that are not actually uh, approved by the, or like in line with the open source definition. Um, Redis source available is a, uh, is a recent uh, license that came into play. Um, Elastic 2.0 is the license that recently came, came into play uh, and I will focus on a little bit later. Um, a lot of services create their own licenses, which is even more difficult uh, to sort of keep, keep track of. Um, there is an interesting one that is the Confluent Community License, uh, for instance, which says that you can use Modified Distribute unless that, it, that competes with Confluence Business. But of course, like Confluence Business could change, right? You, you don't know, it could be like, a, that could be a slippery slope. So if they, if they change what their business is like, then, then use, using uh, something, uh, <laughs> you using their software uh, could then suddenly become illegal. So difficult stuff, 
this, this uh, and yeah, uh, deserves a whole study of its own. Uh, and most people that work in open source or work with open source just want to make use of open source software and not be reading licenses all the time. Um, also, projects just switch license, so how to deal with that? What I did at a conference not too long ago is that whenever a speaker takes a sip of water, the people in the audience applaud because it's actually really difficult to remember. Thank you. All right, and then there's also, besides those kind of li new, ki new licenses, um, or uh, there's also um, another type of, of licenses that are, um, for instance, the uh, ethical licenses. So I don't know if anyone has heard of uh, ethical source or the organization for e ethical source, but for instance, there's a couple of ethical licenses as well, like the Hippocratic license, that is a license that prohibits use of software in violation of internationally recognized human rights, or the ML5, which makes an explicit connection between a license and a project's code of conduct. Um, so the ethical source uh, working group says that over the past 20 years, uh, open source has of course pro proliferated, right? Like it's everywhere, uh, but the developers uh, in open source don't actually have any course of action to make sure that their work isn't used for bad causes. Um, and feel like the open source definitions should move with the times and figure out a way for open source developers to still um, offer all of their, keep offering all of their stuff uh, in an open source manner, but have some sort of uh, way to sort of recourse uh, whenever a bad actor is using their software. If you're interested in learning more about ethical source in particular, please check out ethicalsource.dev uh, because I won't go into it much more. All right, and I know what you're thinking, like open source isn't about licenses, right? Like it's about community and working together and openness and freedom and all of that beautiful stuff. And licenses should just be a, sort of like an instrument to make sure that people use the uh, use software for in the right ways. Um, and, but I do think that this whole discussion around the cloud restricted licenses was a really interesting and, and important one to have uh, with the community. Um, it's just not a way to save open source. First, because it's not compliant mostly with the open source definition, um, but also it takes the code private and that can really hurt a community, right? So um, ch changing, changing your software because you can't use a particular uh, part of code anymore, that's, that's really, really difficult. Um, and it's, I'm not entirely sure, um, or we're not entirely sure if that's something that really was necessary for the e economic sustainability of some of these projects, right? Like Mongo and Elastic were really big companies in their own right, um, so did they really need this? They felt like, yes, they felt used by, for instance, AWS. Um, and even taking enforceability out of the picture, because it's actually really, really hard uh, to sue and win in cases of copyrights or patents infringement. Um, changing to a more restrictive license might cause companies and community members to stay away from your, from your projects. Uh, and that's actually really detrimental to a community and ecosystem. They, so they do provide free writing, yes, uh, but that comes, with, uh, that comes with its own set of problems too. All right. So let's look at some examples of projects changing their license. Um, quite recently, that was uh, Lightband uh, that changed ACA's license from Apache 2.0 to the BSL version 1.1, which is a business source license, and that started with, that would have started with, or did start in October with uh, ACA version 2.7, um, which, I mean, side rent, if you change your license, then <laughs> do it in a major version because you're actually breaking your API. Um, so 2.7 doesn't indicate like something actually really, really changed, but okay. Um, and with any such change, there's always talk of a fork, right? And then um, people that uh, advocate for that fork to, get, to then take a sort of copyleft or infectious license to make sure that whatever changes are made to the fork is not something that the original project can just grab and benefit from because they changed their license, so they shouldn't benefit from any community work anymore. Um, and while it's understandable that that sentiment sort of like arises, um, it is uh, 
sort of the question of how effective this will be and if hurting our fellow devs is actually really what we want. Like, they didn't, that they likely didn't make this decision. So, uh, it might be really misdirected anger. All right, so there was talk of a fork and then there actually is a fork. So, uh, Apache Peco is the fork uh, that is now uh, incubated by the Apache Foundation and thus with the Apache 12.0 uh, license. And actually some people at the um, open source program office at Ivan are very much involved in this, um, in this project. But Shameless plug. Anyway, um, another uh, another project that uh, changed their license is uh, Elastic. Um, I don't know who was who, who who was affected by this, but this was like this was a blow to the community. This was this was super hard, um, and um, uh, yeah. So and and several players then eventually also decided to uh, drive a fork forward. So um, if you're familiar, uh, Open Search is the open source uh, alternative to Elasticsearch. Uh, that also disclaimer, uh, Ivan is very much involved in, um, but so is AWS. So so much for like cloud providers that don't give back to the community. Yes, it's difficult because Elastic actually changed because of AWS, but they are also invested in in, in creating an alternative that continues to be open source. Um, and uh, AWS is actually like really driving that forward as one of the main players and that's, that's again something that is really, really difficult. You'll see a lot of open source projects that almost have a single vendor behind them. Uh, for instance, Apache Kafka, uh, Kafka is also in the Ivan portfolio, or rather the decision of what makes it into the Kafka project is largely in Confluence hands. Um, and that, that, that issue of the single vendor you'll see a lot. Uh, Databricks has a stronghold on Sparks, uh, Google and Beam, uh, Beam are a very similar story too. Then uh, Grafana Labs changed uh, licenses uh, to AGPL version three for Grafana and Loki and, and Tempo. Um, and Google warns against the, this uh, using the AGPL saying that the risk heavily outweigh the benefits. And then the Cloud, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, of course, in response to the license change of third party dependencies to the AGPL, encourages uh, everyone to either switch to an alternative component, freeze the component to the version prior to the license change, or seek an exception <laughs> like from the governing board. So needless to say, they're not big fans. Um, if you install, for instance, Electron, uh, you install 87 packages, and that means 87 license dependencies. And every single uh, package is likely to have their own dependencies as well, and therefore even more licenses that you need to comply with. As you can imagine, license management can get really, really, really complicated. Um, and when done manually, can absolutely create technical debt. So there, um, there are about like 300 plus uh, different open source licenses um, and that list is ever growing. However, the good news is, is that about 20 licenses um, account for like 80% of open source commonly used in enterprises. So if you create a deny and allow, allow list of those type of licenses uh, together with a scanning tool, that would already provide you with a pretty good starting point in managing your license exposure. Um, and of course there is license auditing uh, tools as well that can send you notifications after projects change their license. Um, but it's very re reactive, right? Like you would rather know in advance whenever a project is in, uh, in danger of maybe potentially uh, changing their license or the ways that they you can use it. Um, I mentioned before that license litigation is actually really, really hard. Uh, true, but it does happen. Um, and you might end up um, having, needing to change your software in order to comply with the license of tools that you're using. Um, and uh, that's not great. That's a lot of work. And also you uh, uh, might actually get a lot of bad press for uh, not being able to comply with a license and especially in very sensitive industries, uh, that's, that's difficult for, for a company. Did you already show me some time, or am I still going? I'm still going. Okay, I'm doing great. <laughs> okay, reference time. 
Um, Dotam uh, Horowitz, uh, who works for Logs.io, actually gave a really, really interesting talk about uh, when Elastic changed their license and how they dealt with that, that change. So definitely check out their talk. <sighs> Making friends here. Uh, okay. I want to switch uh, gears a little bit and talk about maintainer. Now you show me time, okay. <laughs> uh, about maintainers and about maintainer resources. And uh, there was a tight lift uh, survey in 2021 uh, that uh, came back that 46% um, of maintainers are not paid at all. No, no big surprises there. Uh, only 26% earn more than 1,000 per year, which I don't know what your little mortgages look like, but that doesn't get you very far. Um, and almost half of the responder, uh, responders um, uh, also said that they have considered uh, to quit, uh, or they have either quit or considered to quit over, uh, and list that, that uh, lack of financial uh, compensation as a, one of the prime motivators for that. Um, so open source libraries allow all of us to move faster, but if they're poorly maintained and they're not healthy, they c can become a single point of failure. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm like preaching to the choir, but who knows. So um, I mentioned before that uh, Contributing Today is a, a meetup that I ran, and one of our uh, guests was uh, Henry Zhu, who's of course the Babel maintainer. Um, and um, he, uh, his story was really, really interesting because he, he mentioned at one point that um, people around him got upset that he would spend a lot of time uh, fundraising for the project um, just to make sure to keep it funded, right? Um, so he spends time uh, talking on podcasts and uh, to try and get donations. Um, and they were like, but you should work on the project. Why are you not committing more code? Like, what is, what is this? You're a maintainer. Um, and uh, he really struggles with this too because he feels almost like guilty whenever he is doing any kind of like marketing or pro a promotion for the project. Um, and so we've, we've come to this weird place where we think that whenever we're donating, like we're, we have a FOSS fund, we donate 10K to a project. Yes, but you know, y'all are software people. What do you earn uh, uh, annually? You don't need to say this. You can tell me later. We can talk about it later. But it's all, the, the 10,000 is nothing, and especially when your project is not necessarily set up to kind of sort of distribute that kind of money to all of your contributors. Like, it only introduces a lot of complexities. It doesn't really help a lot. Um, and, and I think it's interesting that while a company would love to have some runway in order to do their job, uh, when you have an open source project, uh, that might actually send the wrong signal because you didn't need the money. You, you developed this project before without getting money. So now, wh what do you need this for? Um, and it sort of ties into this whole toxic notion that an open source, that open source shouldn't be about money, right? Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't be paid ever because only when you are in your mom's basement, deprived of sunlight, then you're like this true unspoiled hacker, but it's ridiculous. It really is ridiculous. Um, anyway check out this uh, episode because it was really, really interesting. Um, there, uh, another reference time. Uh, Bartolome uh, did a wonderful talk at State of Open uh, Con uh, earlier this month uh, and talked about uh, lessons learned uh, uh, developing and maintaining the Thanos project um, and sort of like, yeah, what as a maintainer, uh, if, if he could go back to like ba baby, baby Thanos maintainer, what could he, could he tell them? And if you're anyway there um, uh, on, on the, the YouTubes of uh, State of OpenCon, you can also check out Dawn's talk about open source strategies. It was a really, really good one too. Um, all right, so some examples, and I will rush to some of them, uh, of open source projects that uh, you know, sort of like went bad and then and, and got, got all of us in a sort of a carfuffle. Um, one of them was, for instance, LaughPad. Do you all remember what happened to LaughPad, sort of, kind of? So many hands. Um, all right, so LaughPad did almost nothing, no? It, it sort of like padded out the left-hand side uh, of strings with zeros and spaces, but still thousands of projects relied on it, including also Babel from Henry. Um, 
And when the maintainer removed the project from NPM out of spice, these applications and like wild, uh, widely used uh, uh, bits of open source infrastructure were unable to uh, obtain the dependency and then fell over. Um, so um, the maintainer was really just gr gruntled um, some uh, some project from uh, uh, Kick, if you know, uh, used the same sort of name, and the, they wanted to claim that namespace on NPM, and so uh, um, lawyers went after NPM's admins uh, claiming brand infringement, uh, and instead of NPM uh, standing behind this maintainer, who had, by the way, 200 other projects hosted on NPM, um, they decided to pull the project, and he was, he was very, very angry. Um, there's many such uh, examples. Uh, maybe you've heard of Seth Fargo, and uh, when he discovered that some of the things that he had developed for Chef were then used by uh, ICE, the customs and integrations uh, uh, in, in the US, uh, pulled, pulled his code. And when uh, there was a whole upheaval over that, he was like, well, it's actually in my sort of will that if I were to die, uh, tomorrow, those those libraries would also be pulled from the internet, so better be ready. Um, uh, colors and faker JS. Anyone familiar with what happened for those? Uh, <laughs> it's <just> like yes. <laughs> um, right, very popular projects. Very very popular. Um, to to illustrate, um, colors uh, has scored more than two, uh, three point three billion downloads throughout its lifetime. Uh, and has over 19,000 projects that depend on it. Um, and uh, both, both uh, projects were hijacked by the maintainer, by the way. Um, and uh, later, uh, it became clear that it was likely because the developer had expressed an intention already of no longer supporting uh, big companies with his free work, um, and that businesses should actually either fork the projects or pay him, and I quote, a six-figure salary, which fair enough. Like, we all rely on these projects. So like, what, what, why do we think we can get away with it? Um, another one is no, Node IPC. I'm running low on time, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly throw through this. But uh, Node IPC, uh, the developer behind this, uh, sabotaged some versions uh, of the library in protest. He said it's protest where um, for uh, uh, in protest of the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, and so definitely users in spe specifically Russia and Belarus were affected, uh, affected by this change. Um, last week, CoreJS, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, definitely have a read. Oh my God, what a shit show. Um, I didn't want to swear on stage, did I, sir? I didn't swear. Um, we're in Europe, dude, we can't swear on stage. Okay. Um, Generally, open source is part of our infrastructure and our products and our tooling. Um, and for this reason, we need to care about it if, as if they were our own projects. Uh, no company will leave any of their critical infrastructure or in-house developed tech stack unmaintained. So why are we willing to do so for the ones that are open source? Log4j, don't need to tell you about that. Um, so sometimes we think that uh, open source is inherently op uh, secure. The code is out in the open. <laughs> So if anything, if, so if anything is broken, right, like people will see it and they will mitigate that, right? Like, um, but then how do you explain all of these things? And how do you explain Log4j and Heartbleed? So that many eyes argument is very, very shaky because it needs the right people to look in the right places. And I feel like most developers come to open source for solutions and not for more problems. A uh, lot of stuff to back that up. Um, but I want to go quickly through some of the things that we can actually do to make sure that open source is sustainable. Um, so making sure, you, you all have a place in making sure that open source is sustainable. One of those things is to invest your time and to invest your money, uh, but only when it's applicable. Sometimes people, projects have enough of your pull requests, all right? Enough already. But they do need help triaging issues or uh, with code reviews. So spend time where project might really need your time uh, and spend money whenever they can accept, for instance, through GitHub sponsors, uh, 
but only when it's applicable again. Um, make sure that you're, you yourself are an excellent open source project. Maybe put, if you're a company, put some maintainers on the payroll and make sure that they don't have to comply to the same or, or they're not tracked by the same OKRs as the rest of your engineering department because open source moves at a different timeline. Uh, so please like measure them accordingly as well. Join a foundation maybe. Um, and join forces with other organizations. There are other organizations that rely on the same libraries than you do. So make sure that you can maintain them together and they're not uh, dependent on just the one, the one single vendor. And when you participate in open source, please look at the uh, principles of authentic participation. Um, don't think that you can just fork a project uh, and maintain a bunch of mirrors of all the projects that you rely on because also, first of all, congratu congratulations, you're now a maintainer of a lot of open source projects and people will come to you with all of their issues. You don't want that. Uh, but also, open source projects are, you know, like vulnerabilities get fixed too and sometimes vulnerabilities are in a code for a really, really long time, weeks, months, years. Um, and you want to benefit from all of those patches too. Good. Totally on, in time, right? You were great, you were great. Thank you, Floor. Um, I'm gonna please keep, stay I'm on gonna stage. Keep the water. You, you can keep the water, Thank uh, you. but leave the laptop. Please it's, give it it's up for Floor again. And I must say, I must say, you were perfectly on time when you mentioned investing in open source because the guy, I saw the guys from Rabobank coming in. <laughs> Hello. Oh, actually, I, 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 gave, I, gave, no, I gave a very similar talk to Rabbit <laughs> once, so maybe they will remember me. Fantastic. Do we have, we have time for two questions, if you're okay, Floor? Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Hey, um, I hey. am becoming increasingly worried about packages and maintainers' right to die, right? Like my right to no longer maintain something. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I reached out to the Colors and Fakers maintainer. And yeah, they're super extreme, but also I was like, hey, thank you so much. Yeah. That was the kind of action that we need to take. Totally illegal for Microsoft to then go and take on ownership of that repository because the license plainly states the roles and responsibilities of the end user, right? Yep. Not appropriate. Um, right now, there's a bunch of maintainers that don't want to be in corporate open source. Yep. And those are the ones that are mostly at risk. So can we find alternative models to engaging with open source in the wild that doesn't require them to work at Google? No, yeah, because they shouldn't need to work at Google if they don't want to work at Google, 100%. Um, I feel like we have way too little avenues for, uh, for maintainers that don't want to be employed to be able to have a consistent income. And that's absolutely a problem. And that's something that we need to talk about. And if that's, if that's funding through some other way or helping them to actually be able to, uh, to get funding because that's also uh, this is complicated, right? Like it's almost like you're running a business. What? Um, so yeah, there needs to be more work there and there's way too little work there. It's pockets of money here and there and you're spend, you end up spending too much time like Henry, like just to get those pockets of money consistently to, to make sure that your project can continue. Um, yeah, so 100% agree. So Do we one have more one more hand question? Up, yeah. Yes. First of all, I like your shoes. Thank you. I love them too. <laughs> um, so uh, my question is, um, if you look at open source maintainers or software developers, um, I think there's also a sort of social issue because if you have to maintain an open source project, you also have to sort of lead a community. And I think in that point of view, the best example is Linus Torvalds being unable to communicate with the other kernel developers in a way that uh, people feel appreciated for the work they do. And I think that's also one of the things that might um, help those projects to prosper if, if we could um, invest a bit more in that aspect. Yeah, for me, it would be super interesting to see if we can find some people to get more involved in open source that have some of those skills that come into play whenever you want to start uh, running a community. So more attention for the non-code contributions, but maybe for building a community and 
uh, doing technical documentation really well and marketing and there's so many roles to play in open source and uh, that are that go beyond code 100 percent uh and and you can't be everything to everyone uh, as single maintainer like that's just it takes a lot of time that's why companies have all of these different roles right like um yeah i wish that that would be more appreciated uh yeah, but then you look at GitHub and you see only see the green little, you know, blocks for code changes and there should be green blocks for for all kinds of things. Yeah. Thank you, Floor. Thank was, you. It was great. Uh, definitely <laughs> contribute to open source. And I do have a couple of questions about the chickens, but I, I'll leave that <laughs> for later. We can talk about it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm just glad there was no chickens killed for the barbecue today. That's good. No, 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 no. There were a lot of there were a lot of veggies killed though. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, guys. Uh, we are going to have our next talk in ten minutes. So some of you may just have come in, and uh, you want to stay here. The others, please stay here. So we're gonna be together again in ten minutes. <laughs>